this is a makeup lecture for spring 2016 uh, for Western Civ 2 uh, LO class. Uh, if you're wondering why I'm looking over here, I've got my laptop set up with my class notes uh, so that I'm not flipping papers around. Um, but I told you that I would finish up this lecture online so that we can get back up to speed so that Monday, this coming Monday, we can have fun talking about modern ideologies. Uh, if you are so interested and inclined, there is a modern ideologies lecture, basically a, the same lecture, uh, maybe a little boring, uh, that I will be giving on Monday and Wednesday. So if you want to prep yourself, uh, it is on this same channel. Now, last class period, we just got started talking about the Industrial Revolution. And I know that the Industrial Revolution is kind of a, a boring subject, uh, but it's something that, um, well, has affected your day-to-day -day life, my day-to-day -day life. We are living in not just the industrial world, but many people call the post-industrial world, where uh, in countries like the United States and Western Europe, where the Industrial Revolution has already taken hold, uh, we have become used to mass-produced products, but the industrial capability of actually producing those products is now moved to countries like Mexico and China. Now, we of course in the class went over the preconditions for the Industrial Revolution. We talked about the end of the guild system and of course the importance of this is that the guild system monopolized information and monopolized the knowledge and the skill of the various crafts when you were called a craftsman back before the Industrial Revolution, this was a sign of respect. Uh, this was something that, as a working man or a working individual, uh, you could take pride in because as a craftsman, especially an expert craftsman, a master craftsman, it meant that you were now your own man. You were your independently, uh, independently employed craftsman. If you were a journeyman, it meant that you worked for somebody else. And of course, if you were apprenticed, you were apprenticed to somebody else. Now, of course, we talked about how the guilds and how craftsmen wanted to keep the number of craftsmen relatively small. The smaller the number of people who know how to build a clock, know how to build a stone building, and do it well, of course, means that they could ask a greater amount of money. Now, of course, this would end, and not overnight, but end with the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, and the increasing availability of information. Now, if you're a craftsman, it doesn't mean you're necessarily a member of a guild, it just means that you have worked in the trades for a good percentage of your life. Now, in order to expand beyond just your small mom-and-pop type of craft shop, you know, a guy who makes shoes or a guy who makes clocks, and to build the massive factories that clocks and shoes are now made into today, we must, of course, have money, capital. And to have capital, we must have investors. Now, we talked about, of course, in class, how investment grows out of an end of the social taboos of lending. During the late Middle Ages and early modern period, we see the reestablishment of the merchant class. However, there were limitations, especially on Christian merchants. The Catholic Church, for example, had restrictions uh, on what could be lent and what could be charged for that money. Um, this, of course, meant that only those individuals that were not Christians could really lend money without being castigated or or um, looked down upon. Um, this, of course, is why uh, people of Jewish descent um, in the Middle Ages tend to be linked with either the crafts or with being merchants or money lenders. We also talked about how free trade and the ideas of Adam Smith were important. Adam Smith, of course, was the advocate arguing that uh, mercantilist systems that barred individuals from uh, trading across national boundaries should be brought down, that individuals should be free to trade with whomever they want to trade with. Now, of course, 
this will have a, a major effect as European markets open up in the period after 1700. Now we also talked about that within countries, the passing of laws protecting people's property, protecting their factories, protecting their tools, protecting their intellectual properties like copyright and patent uh, were important legal protections. Why come up with a new invention if the law is not going to protect that invention and allow you to be able to benefit, you know, benefit greatly from it? And so these are the preconditions for the Industrial Revolution. Protections of property, the ability to trade, the availability uh, of ideas, uh, the availability of capital. Uh, these are important and essential for the Industrial Revolution. But there's another essential, uh, essential element to any Industrial Revolution. And the court, this, of course, is excess population. Now, we just started touching upon this last class period. Now, the effects of the Columbian Exchange. Now, what is the Columbian Exchange? Well, the Columbian Exchange I did not define in class. The Columbian Exchange is, of course, what we historians call the transfer of plants, animals, and ideas, diseases, and people from the new world, new world to the old and vice versa. With Christopher Columbus's discovery of the new world, this not only opened up new lands for cultivation, which is incredibly important. This is why the United States uh, is still, started out as, and still is one of the major agricultural producers in the world. But it also opened up a new variety of crops. Corn, native to Central and North America, uh, was unheard of in places like Europe before this. And now, of course, corn is a staple crop. Wheat, of course, was introduced into North America and is now uh, grown in the American Midwest, and we export a great deal of it. Potatoes, something that is almost synonymous with Irish cooking, is actually native to South America. Uh, the potato was unheard of again before uh, the Spanish conquered South America. Uh, the potato is a very interesting uh, crop because it is a subterranean crop. It's a root. And originally, uh, they don't look like the Idaho bakers that we use today. This, of course, is, uh, comes out of the fact that these russet potatoes were bred to look the way they were. Originally, potatoes were kind of like, you know, they looked like claws. Um, Catholic missionaries actually described them as the devil's hand. Uh, and they were actually, I don't, know, I don't know if you would call it excommunicated by the church, but they were considered evil in, 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 in some ways. Of course, this turns around with, of course, the breeding of the potato uh, and creating the modern potato that we now know. And of course, it's synonymous with Western cooking, not just here in the United States. Now, we ended with this last class period, the shift from the feudal model to the commercial model. Feudalism, of course, is the political, social, and economic model of the medieval era. That time period from where feudalism was introduced around 700 AD to the time period that feudalism was finally done away with, in Western Europe at least, in the late 16, early 1700s. What is feudalism? Well, feudalism simply is where land is granted to a vassal retainer, a person who swears loyalty to their landlord in exchange for service. So if I am a mid-level noble, I would swear allegiance to the baron or maybe even the king in exchange for hundreds or if, if even thousands of acres. Of course, I'm not going to farm these hundreds of acres myself. So I have even lower nobles, knights, for example, who will swear allegiance to me in order to gain, say, a couple hundred acres. And they, too, are not going to farm it because the noble class was the administrative class during peacetime and the military class during wartime. So who actually does the farming? Well, the lower-level nobles would give land, and I use give in the form of granting privilege to farm the land, to peasants, farmers, 40, 50, 100 acres. In exchange for the right to farm that land, 
the serf, as they become known, not smurf, but serf, the serf would farm the, the land for the, the noble lord and, and pay in kind, usually, in kind meaning they're paying in crops, uh, part of their production to the noble lord. Now, this means that they are not farming their own land. They are farming somebody else's land. They're farming their feudal lord's land. Their landlord, that's where the term landlord comes from. Now, starting around the 1600s, but especially picking up speed, speed in the 1700s, more and more uh, landlords, whether they be titled nobility or even wealthy, um, wealthy commoners, did not want to use the feudal model because the feudal model, even though you are getting something as a landlord from your vassal retainers, you are expected to provide certain items to them. You are supposed to administer them. You are supposed to, of course, provide capital-intensive products to them. In some ways, you're supposed to take care of them, protect them. These, of course, are things that cost a lot of money. However, if you get rid of the feudal model and instead free your serfs, say you're free, you're no longer bound to the land, you no longer have to stay on the plot of land that your ancestors 300 years ago said that they would farm. You don't have to provide that. So for the landlord, it's a winning situation because you don't have to provide anything to your renter, no longer your serf, but your renter, save the land. And your renter does not have to, it does not have to, uh, well, they cannot expect of you anything. And all they are supposed to do is pay you money. Uh, they're, they are in charge of, of selling the product, getting rid of it. They're just going to pay you in cash. So it unloads a lot of the responsibility of the landlord. Now, many people would look at this situation and go, man, that really sucks for the renter. Well, in being freed from the land and the switch to this commercial model, which didn't happen overnight and did not happen without problems, um, the renter also gained from this. Because now the rent renter, the guy who is renting the land, can move. If they find a better deal, they can move. As we will see, if they cannot find a job at all, they can move. Because what's going to happen in Europe and to the United States in a, in a lesser degree is that we're going to see agriculture revolutionized after this switch to the commercial model. We're going to see the need for labor be reduced greatly. And without the need for labor, it means that wages for laborers on the farm drop drastically. And so in order to survive, many have to leave the farm. They have to leave the countryside to seek work elsewhere. Now, what, of course, do we call this? We call this the second agricultural revolution, or the modern agricultural revolution. The very first agricultural revolution happened millennia ago, around 3000 BC, when mankind learned how to uh, domesticate both plants and animals and settle down and farm and herd rather than be hunter-gatherers. Now, the modern agricultural revolution is where the Western world learned how to mechanize, to increase the productive power of one individual so that they can produce as many as many individuals. We see this, of course, starting with inventions like the seed drill of 1701. Now, the seed drill, if you look on the screen, my little marker here is marking. This is a pretty bad representation of a seed drill, but it gets the point across. What we see here is, of course, a machine that is horse-drawn. You don't see the harness, atta harness attached. But it lays off already plowed soil. It deposits seed, and then it covers it back up. It is operated by a single individual, whereupon earlier operations required three, four, or sometimes even five individuals uh, to basically lay off the land. The upper screen the upper picture of the screen, we see later in the 1800s, uh, actually probably in the very early 1900s, we see a, we see a m more modern seed drill. This, of course, can lay off multiple rows being pulled by a mechanized tractor. 
Again, both of these machines illustrate how you can multiply the, the productive effort of the worker. Now, of course, with inventions like the seed drill, it means that more land was needed for cultivation because if you are having these inventions introduced, initially you're wanting to maximize your labor supply and put them to greater and greater work. In 1730, we see the introduction of the iron plow. Later on in the uh, 1800s, we see the introduction of the steel plow. Now, why is the introduction of the iron plow important? Well, simply put, before 1730, most plows were wooden. I mean, meaning the entire plow, including the plow blade, was wood. Maybe the tip had a tip of iron or copper. But in 1730, we see the introduction of the, in, where the entire blade of the plow is iron. This, of course, means that soils that are not really conducive to plowing, like Tennessee red clay mud, rocky soils, and things like that, could be turned over for cultivation. Before 1730, cultivation was limited to sandy or loamy soils. Loamy soils being that kind of, you know, if you see people's gardens who really take care of their gardens, especially flower gardens, you'll notice uh, loamy is, well, um, potting soil, that's loamy, that's loamy soil. Before the introduction, of course, of the iron plow, that was the ideal soil. After 1730, increasingly, you could farm up here in the mountains, for example. Now, in 1786, we see the introduction, of course, the threshing machine. Before the introduction of the threshing machine, how did you thresh your wheat? Threshing wheat, of course, meaning removing the chaff from the seed, uh, from the grain. Well, you took the wheat the end of the wheat stalk, and you put it in a large cloth, like a bed sheet, and you beat the crap out of it. You took wooden mallets and you just smacked this thing on the ground. After a while, you took the bed sheet and you flipped the uh, threshed grain up in the ground, up in the air, and hopefully a good wind, if you're, you did this on a windy day, hopefully the chaff would be blown away, the grain would fall back into the sheet and not be blown away with the chaff. After 1786, you could simply put the, uh, the, the grain, the stalk, through a machine. That's why today you see these giant John Deere tractors pulling a combined machine. This is why they're called combines, because they combine multiple actions into one machine. These giant John Deere combines, which cut the wheat, destalk it, thresh it, and the seed is put into a hopper in the back, and everything else is left you know, on the ground to be picked back up later on. And some of the more even more advanced combines can put the grain in one pocket, the chaff or the, or the bran in another, uh, and put even the, uh, um, the stalk and the, 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 the worthless material, the stuff that we can't, of course, eat, what they call silage. Uh, into a cart that is carried along beside them for use as animal feed. Of course, maximizing the production of the crop. Uh, you'll have to excuse me on my laptop. It just told me it's about to run out of power. So I have need to take a break just for a second. It won't take me more than a minute. Watch I hit the floor. See, you get a dog and pony show with the lecture, even though it's boring. Okay, let's get back. Now, these technical innovations, as we could probably surmise, increase food production at lower prices because you don't need as many people. You don't have to pay as many people. So this lowers food prices. And especially, this is, this is especially good for those people who are not in agriculture, so your merchant class, your craft class, your sailors, your your whatever, these individuals now can buy their their food at lower prices. Now, of course, if you're working in agriculture, you get a lower wage, or you might even lose your job. Now, what this means is that the excess population in the countryside is forced; they have to go somewhere else. Now. Let's just look at this from an economic standpoint. 
lower food prices, especially to those classes that are not being harmed directly by loss of job, means that they have more discretionary income. This means that your craftsmen can put more money into tools or producing whatever they're producing, their clocks or whatever. It means that your merchant class can lower their prices on their goods because their overhead has went down, or if they keep their prices the same, they now have more income for investment. Now, a better diet means that the excess population is going to grow even greater because you have a lower death rate, growth in population. Excess population, as these people move, you're going to see a growth in the cities and towns. And of course, these individuals are not going to be able to find jobs. And they're going to be, well, willing to work for less, cheaper labor. And for manufacturing, that is the ideal. You want cheap labor. That's why all American manufacturers have disappeared for the most part. And they've run overseas to capitalize upon the cheap labor in places like Mexico and China. Now, initially, the excess labor from the farms attempts to find jobs in traditionally available uh, industries, like, for example, sailors or lumberjacking or mining. This, of course, means that it dr forces down the wages in these industries. This is why rules are put in place, for example, by... Uh, sailors demanding that only qualified sailors be hired, uh, limiting who could actually be hired onto ships. It also means that resource extraction industries like mining and timber are going to boom now that they have cheaper labor. Now, of course, if you have cheaper access to things like coal or wood, it means that you can capitalize on those fuels when new power supplies become available. In the late 1700s we see the invention of the steam engine. Now the steam engine, let me see, was it late 1700s or early 1800s? Let me make sure here. Yeah, about 1756, so mid to late 1700s we see the first practical steam engine. And of course steam engines need power, they need fuel. And, of course, this is going to mean that we see a transition when it comes to early factories away from streams where they had naturally been located to capitalize, again, upon the power supply of fast water flowing over a water wheel. They are no longer uh, tied to those water sources once steam is introduced because you can put a steam engine um, on a plant that's built almost anywhere. Now, what is the industry that is fueling this new industrial revolution? Well, with excess population, to put it bluntly, it's cloth because nobody wants to go naked. You have a de higher demand for cloth, which will do two things. First, it will give incentive for people to invent machines, mechanisms to speed up the production of cloth. But it will also mean that people look for substitutes to traditional materials. Traditionally, wool and flax uh, were used in European and American clothes. We know what wool, of course, is. Can you believe people actually wore woolen clothes year-round? Because that was the traditional material to make clothes out. Flax was uh, kind of a poor man's substitute for cotton because flax is similar to a cattail that grows around ponds or water, uh, but it's kind of really hard to process and tends to be uh, kind of uh, stiff and chafing, kind of rough cloth, kind of like burlap. Now, cotton, of course, offers a cheap substitute if it can be produced if it can be refined, and we'll talk about the major hurdle to the refining of cotton here in just a minute. To produce all of these materials into cloth, of course you need looms and you need weavers. Now before 1733, weavers, or people who operated hand looms, were traditionally men because these looms were, as I said, hand-operated. They were uh, 
Well, they had to be operated by somebody with relatively long arms. I don't know if you can see it in the little screen to the side here, but I have relatively long arms. The reason why long arms were necess ne ne necessary was that in order to weave, you had to pass the thread between the, the rows of thread that were being woven together. That's what weaving is, is you're weaving these, these, these rows of thread together into cloth. And you would take a needle and you would just run it through one side. You would rack the loom. You'd run it through to the other side. You'd rack the loom. And you had somebody literally pass this through. So, the, so these bolts of cloth, that's what a length of cloth is called, a bolt of cloth, was only normally three feet wide, or maybe six feet wide, if two individuals were working in unison. But in 1733, John Kay, an English weaver, invented a simple little device known as the flying shuttle. Now, the flying shuttle is nothing more than a weighted bobbin. Some of you have probably seen these at craft stores or antique stores and not realized what it was, but it is a ground shaking invention when it comes to the textile industry. So it is either made out of metal or metal tipped, but it's usually the, the structure itself is wooden. And right in the center there is a cutout hollow for a bobbin of thread, of course, with an axle put through it. And it's weighted so that you could throw it, you could toss it through the loom, throw it from one side to the other. This meant that you didn't have to, have to reach through and hand the thread to somebody else or leave it there if you're just making a narrow bolt of cloth. It means that you could have two individuals running the loom and the loom be 10, 12 feet wide. You could just toss it through. And of course, when looms are mechanized around 1800, it means that the flying shuttle is a part of the machine that just runs back and forth. If you want to know what a mechanized flying shuttle looks like, all you need to do is watch the movie Wanted, you know, the Angelina Jolie hitman flick. Most of you have seen it. The big thing is the guy has to catch the shuttle. He has to catch this thing that's flying back and forth in the weaving mill that is where the, uh, where the assassins hang out. That is the flying shuttle. Now, of course, with the advent of the flying shuttle, it means that larger bolts of cloth could be manufactured far more quickly. It means that individuals who do not have long arms, like women, for example, could be employed. This is why uh, John Kay, in 1735, had his house and factory attacked by angry weavers, because this one little invention meant that they were now in competition with a greater number of people. But it also meant that there was a greater demand for thread. Before 1760, how did you get thread? Well, you literally had to take a wad of wool or a wad of cotton or a wad of whatever you were trying to spin, put it on a hook, and then hand turn it. This is why thread before 1760 for common clothes was really rough. This is why silk was in such high demand because silk naturally is a fine thread. It's, well, it's crapped out of the end of a worm. Now, in 1760, another Englishman by the name of James Hargreaves invents this thing. This, of course, is known as the spinning jenny. When I was a kid, I thought it was an upturned bicycle. This simple device allowed for a single individual to spin without any spinning of their own hands. They just had to pull on it, but spin relatively fine thread. This, of course, increases the production of thread. In 1779, just you know, less than 20 years later, uh, the Englishman Samuel Crompton will invent this machine right here. This is the mule. Now the mule is the same idea as the spinning jenny, just multiplied. As you can see here, you have multiple spinners producing multiple threads at a time. This of course increases greatly the demand for 
the raw material in order to make thread and thus make it into bolts of cloth that will then be used by tailors to make clothing. In 1793, the American gun maker and uh, hat pin maker, Eli Whitney, solves the problem of cotton. Up until 1793, cotton had not been cost effective as a material of choice for clothing and textiles. The reason why is the seeds. It was labor intensive to take not only pick cotton, but to actually sit there and pick these cotton seeds out. Now cotton seeds look kind of like three-sided ninja stars. They have little fingers on them, little hairs that cling to the lint, that's the white stuff, the stuff your clothes are made out of, and makes it very difficult for them to be removed. Eli Whitney, as a gun maker and hat pin maker, made a relatively simple machine that used two metal combs that was automated, that would strain the cotton lint through these combs, thus pulling the cotton seeds out. Now, the early cotton gins are enormous machines. They're the size of a barn, but they're highly efficient. No longer do you need an army of individuals to seed cotton. You just need an army of individuals to grow cotton. This is one reason why in the 18, early 1800s we see an explosion of slavery across the American Southwest. The founders of this country in 1776 and when they wrote the Constitution in 1787 to 1789 thought slavery would die. This is one reason why many, many anti-slavery proponents uh, just kind of said, okay, we'll leave it to the states because it'll be limited to South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, and Virginia, and it won't grow anywhere else. They did not see, foresee in the future that once the cotton gin was invented, cotton which needs a lot of labor in order to, to grow it, would explode all throughout the American uh, Southeast, what was known as the Old Southwest back then, and of course lead to the uh, sectional tensions and finally the Civil War in this country. Now as these machines grow larger, especially the looms, in 1800 the power loom is introduced now, the power loom is simply a man-powered loom ran from a central source. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen pictures of old factories, but old factories around the mid to, you know, even late 1800s, you see a central shaft running along the roof, and off of that central shaft, you see leather belts um, running whatever machines are on the factory floor. This is in an age before the electrification of the factory. Now that central crankshaft, that central power line, if you will, had to be powered by something and this initially it was powered by water power and later by steam engines. But with the introduction of the power loom, now you could have larger buildings with multiple looms built into them. And the larger the loom, the more efficient the weaving was because you could have larger bolts of cloth being made. Now if one of the problems with larger machines is that you can only build them so large using the traditional building material of wood. Wood breaks when it's put under high stress. This is why you see uh, again in antique malls and craft malls around here you see quaint old machines all made out of wood with maybe a few metal parts but they do the same job as larger, bigger metal machines do today. Now, the problem for the West is that the main material that would be ideal for these new machines, iron, iron initially was difficult to produce. Iron required a level of skill that was almost an art form. 
the men who knew these knew that skill were known as either iron puddlers or iron mongers. These are individuals that again inherited uh, sort of the uh, the old craft guild mentality that they passed on their knowledge to their apprentices and their journeymen. If you did not smelt iron correctly, it would be worthless. Iron with many impurities or air pocket inclusions would fail. It'd break quite easily. It'd shatter. Even when smelted right, iron has a cru cru crucial weakness. Because iron can only be made one of two ways. It can be made to be incredibly strong. That means that it will not bend. But it becomes fragile from that strength. That's why um, if you have any old uh, cast iron skillets, you'll notice that some cast iron skillets you see inevitably have their handles broken off of them. That's because they're incredibly strong. They will not bend. But if hit with a shock, like with a sledgehammer, they'll crack. You can also make iron malleable. Malleable iron can be heated and then beat basically into shape. Horseshoes are a classic example of malleable iron. The problem with malleable iron is that it cannot be used in situations where it has to be incredibly strong because it will warp. Now before 1740, before, actually before 1850, that was the only material that Europeans had. The, the ideal material was steel. Now steel had been around before the 1850s, but the problem for steel is it took a level of skill, it took a level of art to make it that only the best metal workers in the world knew how to make it. That's why during the medieval era, that's why before 1850, if you knew how to make and craft steel, you were an artisan of the highest degree. This is why steel blades, this is why steel was almost used, used exclusively for swords, for example, uh, because it was so expensive. Samurai swords, for example, or European officers' swords. For industry, they had to settle on iron. Now, of course, you needed cheap iron. Now, in 1708, the Englishman Abraham Darby uh, would invent the blast furnace. Now, the blast furnace would help increase iron production because by using superheated air being blown actually through the material that you're smelting, iron ore, limestone, uh, various other metals in, or uh, materials in order to create slag. Slag is nothing more than the impurities being drawn out of the iron ore so that it can be skimmed off the surface. The blast furnace facilitates this and increases its production. The problem for Darby's type of blast furnace was that the blast furnace was well, it was low. It was a rock. It was basically a, a pit in the ground, and so you had to smelt your iron, wait for it to cool down, remove it before you could do the next batch. In 1740, the Englishman Benjamin Huntsman creates what is known as the crucible furnace. The crucible furnace is important because it is where you have initially a clay pot. Today, they use graphite. But you could use a clay pot, a fireproof clay pot, and have it, and the air would be blown through openings in the clay pot. And when that was done, you could remove the clay pot and set it aside, let the material cool, then have it knock it out or even break the, the clay pot, while you're already doing another batch. Of course, this increases the production using the technology at hand. Now, as I mentioned before, iron has a crucial weakness. That's why if you see old machines that are made out of cast iron, that's why engine blocks that are made out of cast iron, they are heavy. They're overbuilt. They are enormous. 
because in order to protect against the fragility of the strong, non-malleable iron, they have to be overbuilt. They have to be made so that they can take a hit or a shock without cracking. Now, of course, the ideal material is steel. The steel was too expensive to be used in early locomotives, to be used in railroad rails, to be used in early power looms and things like that. However, independently in 1851 and then again in 1855, the American William Kelly and the Englishman Henry Bessemer would independently, of course that's what we know now, uh, or that we think now, uh, independently came up with a way of creating steel relatively cheaply. What they did is they took the ideas first pioneered by men like Darby and Huntsman and combined them so that what you did is you took the blast furnace and you burnt off all the impurities, including carbon, from the iron. Now, any of you who know metallurgy know that Carbon is what makes iron into steel. So why are they burning off the excess carbon? The reason why is they want pure pig iron, pure iron, that can then be smelted in what is known as a Bessemer converter. This right here. Now what the Bessemer converter does is by adding what they called charges, charges being iron, coke, which is uh, pure carbon made from coal, for example, that is heated in an airless, oxygenless environment. And if you also, if you want to make an alloy of steel, which steel is already an alloy of iron and carbon, if you want to make another alloy, you can add things like zinc or tin or gallium or other metals in order to get the, the desired steel you want. Now, these Bessemer converters would then, of course, mix these, allow them to sit there and mix together in an airless environment, the, so you don't have oxygen causing corrosion, causing oxidation. And then at the bottom, these converters would be tapped, allowing the steel to flow out, the slag to be taken away, and of course the steel to be cooled into ingots and then processed later on. So if you went to a steel mill, even today, what they do if they are getting iron ore, they're actually first making iron in blast furnaces and then transferring uh, the, the metal through crucibles into modern day Bessemer converters or Bessemer furnaces. Now like anything, sometimes the process of transitioning from iron to steel is not instantaneous. This is why, even though the Kelly Bessemer process is discovered before the American Civil War, it's not until the 1880s that steel starts to supersede iron as the material of choice, first with railroads. Now, as iron is able to be made cheaply, and then later on the ease of uh, steel production uh, is also made easier. You have the ideal materials for making an alternative power source to traditional water wheels. In 1756, the Englishman James Watt developed the very first practical steam engine. Now, when I say first practical, the steam engine had been around earlier than 1756, but it was more of a, uh, a, a, a toy, if you will, an oddity. But James Watt came up with the first practical one in order to pump out English coal mines. Because as Britain expanded its mining operations, the surface mines, the, the, the low-level mines, the mines that were only you know a few hundred feet down, were mined out. And so they were forced to go deeper and deeper and deeper. The deeper you go into the earth, of course, one of the major problems is water entry. Now you're going down below the surface water. Now these early steam engines that Watt designs and are built for coal mines are enormous contraptions. 
Uh, there's actually one on display here in the United States out in, I believe it's Nevada. It was built during the silver boom out there in the late 1800s. This thing stands about six stories tall. The cast iron flywheel on it is four stories tall and is made out of several different parts. It's actually cast in pieces and then bolted together. So these early steam engines are not small, uh, but they do do their job. And with the advent of steam, it eliminates one of the problems for manufacturers. Because when you're talking about manufacturing a product, let's think of it this way. First and foremost, you have to have access to raw materials. You have to have access to what you're making your product out of. You have to have access to a labor supply. You know, you have to have a population in order to work in the factory. You have to have access to the market, you know, to sell your goods to. And then finally, you need to have access to a power source. Now, before the advent of the steam engine, you had to have your factories built along rivers in order to capitalize upon water power. Now, there's a fifth, a fifth thing that you need. You need to have access to some transportation method. Now, the steam engine will help with both of these right here. Because with the steam engine, you no longer have to be tied to a power source. A steam engine can be built anywhere. You can have it built close to where your raw materials are coming out. You can have the steam engine built close to your labor supply. And that's where, that's where manufacturers choose to build it. This is one reason why early on in the Industrial Revolution, say here in the United States, you see factory towns, textile mill towns, that are built along rivers in Massachusetts. And whole populations are moved there in order to work them. But with the advent of the steam engine, factories powered by steam are instead built in places like Chicago, New York City, Camden, New Jersey, with a pre-existing population, especially a population that is being that is that is swelling due to immigration from Europe into the United States. As I said, around 1800. Edmund Cartwright decides, uh, designs the power loom. By 1800, Watt's engine, his steam engines, are being used to power mills. Now, I don't need to stay very long on this, uh, this steam power slide because I've already went over all of this. Now, with the advent of steam, you see a greater demand for fuel. Now, before the Industrial Revolution, countries like Great Britain were heavily forested. However, today, Great Britain has had a lot of its forest taken down, denuded, because initially these steam engines burnt wood. But as wood became scarcer and scarcer in places like Great, like Great Britain, other fuel sources, most notably coal, became paramount. This is why England stays at the, at the lead in the Industrial Revolution, because Britain has an abundance of coal in places like Wales and southern England, thus allowing it to capitalize upon the steam engine. Now finally, in order to tie the factory to its labor supply, its markets, its raw materials, there needed to be a transportation revolution. There needed to be a revolution from just the horse and wagons that had been used prior to the 1800s. Now, today we take roads for granted. That's our primary mode of transportation. However, before the 1900s, roads were not the primary mode of transportation. Roads have historically been harder to be build. It's not until, of course, the advent of heavy machinery have projects like the interstate system been possible. The very first 
transportation networks that allowed for the Industrial Revolution to occur were not roads, but instead traffic on existing rivers or even canal building. A good example of how canals can facilitate trade, commerce, and the expansion of industry, all we need to look at is the Erie Canal here in the United States. In the 1820s, New York Governor DeWitt Clinton got the New York State Legislature to grant funds for the building of a canal from the capital, capital of New York, Albany, to Buffalo on Lake Erie. People thought this to be a fool's errand. They thought, this is not going to do anything. They actually derided Clinton, and they called it Clinton's Ditch. However, once completed by the 1840s, the Erie Canal, as it would become known, would make New York the premier port in this country because Buffalo, New York, located on Lake Erie. The, the five Great Lakes are connected to each other. Before the St. Lawrence, St. Lawrence Seaway was completed in the 1950s, the only way to ship goods from the areas around the Great Lakes to the Atlantic was through the Erie Canal. So, coming from the Erie Canal, goods that are produced in America's breadbasket of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, are able to be transported cheaply on canal boats to Albany, New York, down the Hudson River to New York for then transshipment to the rest of the country or to Europe. Now, another canal built in the late 1840s, the uh, Illinois and Michigan Canal would connect Lake Michigan with the headwaters of the Mississippi River, thus allowing goods coming out of the Midwest to flow down the Mississippi River. Now, even with access to the Mississippi River, trade can be problematic at best. In the early 1800s, you see Americans, for example, colonizing the Mississippi uh, the, the Trans-Mississippi region, basically Western Tennessee, Missouri, Arkansas, Illinois, any of those areas of the country that you can get to via the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Cumberland, or the Ohio rivers. The problem is rivers run one way, sometimes with a very strong current. So it was very cheap to send goods down the river and incredibly expensive to ship them up the river before the advent of steam-powered shipping. Let's see here. In 1807, Robert Fulton, an American, designed this ship right here. This is the Claremont. Now, the Claremont, Fulton designed as an ocean-going ship. However, between the 1830s and the 1870s, Ocean-going traffic would be dominated by sail-powered clipper ships, very efficient, very fast sail-powered ships. However, the ideas of a paddle-wheel steamer would be applied to the shallow-draft ships that, pl that plied not only the American waterways, but also European waterways, opening up trade both directions. Now, after the American Civil War, in both Europe and the United States, you will see the growth of this right here. The railroads. Now this rail, this locomotive right here is probably circa 1870s. In the 1840s when the first practical locomotives were built, they were small little little engines that could pull very little. It would take until of course after the uh, American Civil War, especially with the advent of cheaper steel, that large locomotives could be built. Now with the advent of a better material and more technology and the desire to push west after the American Civil War, you would see ribbons of steel be laid out across the American West allowing Americans to not just travel from the eastern United States to the west coast 
cheaper than sailing around uh, South America. Remember, the Panama Canal was not finished until 1914. But it would also allow for the settlement of America's interior. Who would want to live in Kansas if you could not get your crops to market? If you could not import wood to build houses? If you could not import tools? Nobody. So the fact that the American breadbasket is so productive comes from the fact that it has easy availability to markets and to goods produced by industry. Now let's talk about those goods produced by industry. Now this will overlap with the older lecture that I want you guys to watch but I thought about doing the entire lecture from start to finish but uh, I have some other things to get done today and I need to get this up. Also, I need to get this thing up and processed for you guys to watch. But I'm going to go ahead and go over this slide right here. So if there is some duplication, uh, you can just skip forward uh, on the second slide or the second lecture. Now, Eli Whitney, our good friend who, who invented the cotton gin, Eli Whitney had failed to get a patent for that cotton gin. This meant that once he started producing cotton gins of his own, his competitors merely just bought a cotton gin, took it apart, figured out how it worked, and started making their own. Like most Americans, Whitney was looking for his fortune. So in the early 1800s, as this country expanded westward, and the U.S. government needed more and more muskets for our army, especially after the War of 1812 proved the United States needed to maintain a military force. Whitney would try and garner a government contract. The problem for Whitney, and he understood this, was that he was competing against pre-existing government arsenals that made hundreds of guns each day. So Whitney needed to find a niche, an in, a gimmick, if you will, now, what he found was something that would change the world. Because what Whitney did was, as a master gunsmith, he had journeymen who worked for him and apprentices. He divided his workers among different tasks and assigned them one or two to make barrels, one or two to make hammers, one or two to make trigger locks, one or two to make stocks, and then one or two to put it all together. In doing this, Whitney inadvertently started the process of making nearly identical parts. Because one, one worker was making that part and that part alone. Now, he got the contract because the military was impressed when he took his, I believe it was only nine guns, to show them but he had his workers take those guns completely apart and then put them back together again after mixing the parts up. And most of the guns fired and fired safely. Now, after Whitney did this in the early, night, early 1800s, others, including Europeans, the Germans, for example, would come up with a better way of making almost identical parts because even with Whitney's uh, system of one worker hand filing, say, a hammer, those hammers are not going to be identical to each other because one worker is going to make variations in how they're making those parts. However, if I file that part down and I have a gauge that will tell me when I have taken off just the right amount of material but not taken off too much, then those parts are near as identical as you need to make them interchangeable. This is where we get the idea of the gauge. The gauge, in the form of what is often called the go or the no-go gauge, is a series of gauges that checks every dimension of a part. The go gauge, say I'm checking this bearing right here. 
I don't know why I have a bearing on my desk, but I'm checking this bearing right here. And I put it in to a round fixture that checks its diameter. The go gauge means that that bearing needs to go into the fixture. The no go gauge it should not go. If it goes, the bearing is too small and outside of spec or outside of the specification. Now, the dimensions between the go and the no-go gauge are not identical to each other. There is a given variation. If you guys build engines or have done work on motors or anything like that, you will notice in, um, in um, product or in building specifications or something like that. There is a variation, allowable variation in a part. It is so big, say plus or minus five thousandths of an inch. That's the allowable variation in the interchangeable and nearly identical part. That's what the gauges are testing for. Now later on you have the introduction of what is called machine tools. Now machine tools can be as simple as a drill press or a lathe. Later on these drill these machine tools get incredibly part specific where they're where they're designed only to make one type of part or actually make one cut in one part. And later on instead of taking the part off and gauging it and put it back on the gauge is actually built into the machine. Of course, this means you need somebody to operate that machine, but also someone who will come by and set it up. This means the operator does not have to be that skilled, but you need a highly skilled individual who can go around the factory and make sure that the, the uh, machines are set up properly. Thus, you have a professional technician and an unskilled worker. Now, before 1913, even with the production of nearly identical parts, the production process was still crude by today's standards. Up until 1913, for example, if you built a car, you laid out a frame and you brought in the parts and you put, the, put together the car and the workers who did various jobs kind of tripped over each other. And this was noticed by one of the early pioneers in auto production, Henry Ford. Henry Ford was a good friend with a fellow by the name of Gustavus Swift. Swift, earlier on, had pioneered the idea of the disassembly line. Swift had pioneered early meat packing. Basically, his factories took in live cattle, slaughtered them, skinned them, gutted them, and then on a hanging hook moving down the line, you had individual butchers skilled only for one job, taking the animal apart until you got the finished cuts of meat at the very end. Ford simply just reversed the process. Instead of disassembling a cow, he would bring in on sub-assembly lines components that are they themselves put together on an assembly line, and then the components are fed together onto the master assembly line, whereupon at the very end of the master assembly line, the automobile is gassed up and literally dro driven out of the factory. Now, this of course means that you need to have large factories. That there is an incentive to have large machines centrally located in one location. Now, as we will pick up in the next class or the next lecture, I will talk about this as well as the rise of factory towns, working conditions, and the social impacts. Please watch that lecture as well. But I will go ahead and get off the air right here. You will notice that uh, the other lecture is a little older. Um, it is not as well, uh, well processed because this one is done on my desktop using a top, top grade uh, webcam. The other one was done on my laptop. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's adequate, but it is not as good as this one. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, it's, a, it's probably a little on the boring side because I am literally talking to 
my lecture slides right now. It's boring for me, guys. I fully understand this. This is why you need to come to class. This is why I'd much rather be talking to you guys than talking at you through a computer. I'll see you guys later. Bye.